The main character wondered if he was dead. As the truck ran at him, he thought about the fact that he had no talent and had worked hard for 15 years to have enough to eat. Was it really all for the sake of getting hit by a truck? When he opened his eyes, he saw a maid who was calling for Mr. Kschinka. The hero did not understand who Mr. Dzink was, for his name was different. The girl continued to call the hero by that name, telling him how he fell right in front of his royal majesty, that his royal majesty disbanded the convoy and ordered the hero to be deported. The girl cried at how worried she was about him. The hero in confusion asks the maid who he is and where he is. She, frightened by this question, shouted that she would get a doctor right away. The young man's name is Dzink Nonland. He is the 14-year-old heir of Duke Nonland. Since he was a child, he has been in His Royal Majesty's escort in the Kingdom of Rosalt. Today, His Royal Majesty said he no longer wants his son here. House Nonland is a family that has been called Elite Spearmen for many years, and Jink was bad at Sigjutsu, causing him to start misbehaving. It was the past that the hero remembered. He understood why he was disliked by His Majesty. Anyway, he was reborn into this boy. The hero had read similar books about being reborn in another world. He found it hard to believe that such a thing really existed. The maid remarked that Jink San was behaving well today, but Jinkiro's personality was still overwhelming to the young man. After coming to his senses, the hero asked the maid, whose name turned out to be Elsa, if he was really going to be deported. Elsa replied in the affirmative. After the royal majesty disbanded the convoy, Dzinku was ordered to leave the kingdom, and the heir should be Esther. The hero was stripped of his aristocrat status and was ordered to leave the kingdom within a month. Elsa cried, saying how sorry she was. Old Dzink knew that he was being deported. Outside the capital, one could run into monsters, and that was tantamount to a death sentence. Even though the hero has been reborn, nothing has changed. His life is just as worthless. Dzink said he needed to get dressed, to which Elsa offered her help. This caused Dzink to be surprised. The hero saw an inscription above the maid with different characteristics, like statistics from a computer game. Dzink asked her what it was, but Elsa was puzzled. Dzink said he was just imagining something, but was himself surprised that only he could see it. But he saw the statistics and saw it perfectly. He already knows of such a thing. This ability is called Demon Eye. It's rare in this world. He couldn't believe it was real. Jink decided to look at his stats. He could not make out the symbols, then he tried to concentrate as hard as possible. He will have to use this ability very often. It is necessary. The hero noticed that in games you don't even have to work hard for it. Thanks to this effort, he was able to make out the text on his card. From the beginning, he's level 9, level 1 Sigjutsu. He resented why things were the way they were while Elsa addressed him. Everything is categorized by ABC. Fencing had a grade of S, Sigjutsu and Kane handling only F, Fire Magic B, Water Magic S, Air Magic B, Earth Magic A, Alchemy A, Healing S. There was an evaluation ability, Jink immediately realized it was the ability to see stats. And he also had a level S enchantment. He couldn't believe it and cried out in shock. There were only three people in the world with this ability. At this time, the maid was trying to shout to him without realizing what was happening to him. Jink came to his senses and apologized to Elsa, saying that he had forgotten about her. The hero thought that he would have four people with him, and with his ability he could amplify items. It was happily decided to stay to live in this world. Jink's musings were interrupted by a request to enter the room. It was Esther. He said that things were not as good as he thought they would be, and there was nothing he could do about it. To help in some way, he brought some money and a spear for Jink. Dzink thought of his brother Esther being one of the few people who understood him in this house. The hero thanked Esther, but remarked that he could hardly use the spear without a talent for it, to which his brother tried to object. As for money, he asked Esther to buy him something. The merchants in town wouldn't want to deal with Jink since he had lost his title as an aristocrat. His brother said he understood and asked if he needed anything else. The hero asked to buy everything he needed for himself with this money and promised to write a list a little later. The next day, just as Dzink had said, Esther gathered all the things that were on the list. The hero was surprised at how many servants his brother had, even though he is still the future celebrity of House Nunland. Esther remarked that it would be difficult to carry all these things alone. His brother agreed, but promised to tell some things when the rest of the things were brought into the room. Dzink said that he had decided to leave this country and that he would have no one with him, for his father had driven him away. The hero showed his brother his ability called Volt, which looked like a portal. 
He asked Esther not to tell anyone about this ability, and he himself learned about it only yesterday. Now he could put all his stuff in there. His brother was very surprised and asked for permission to see what was inside. Dezink agreed, but asked Esther to be careful. The brothers saw a huge empty white room and Esther shouted. He even said how good his brother was. Looking at Esther's stats, Jink noticed the same vault ability, but decided that his brother didn't know about it yet. It didn't say anything about the evaluation ability. The hero asked his brother for a small bottle of his blood. At first his brother was surprised, but after thinking about it, he asked if Dezink wanted to make a contract with him. Dezink said he did, and if Esther didn't want him to. But before he could finish the sentence, his brother interrupted him with his agreement. Dezink thanked Esther and asked him to show him where the Adventurer's Guild was so he could register there. The hero remarked that he would be lost without his brother, and Esther was agreeable to any of his requests. The brothers were walking down the street and phrases came from the crowd that it was the Nonlands coming, that Esther's brother was being deported, that he should be. Dezink understood everything, but he didn't like it. Esther asked his brother not to listen to what was being said about them, but there was nothing he could do. The consequences of a hapless aristocrat's actions are well seen. Dezink had heard of such gossip. Possessing great power, old Dezink treated the commoners badly. But Nanny Elsa had cared for him since childhood, she could be understood. It is not clear why Esther would miss such a brother. Even if the hero remembered his whole life, he still would not be able to understand. In the Adventurer's Guild, the girl was conducting the joining instructions. One must drop some blood on the guild card, then the owner of the blood becomes a rank G adventurer. Finally, the girl asked if the brothers wanted to hear a brief description of the guild, but that they agreed, though Jink pointed out the large amount of red tape involved. An adventurer could get ranks from G to SS, initially they would get rank G, but if they joined again they wouldn't get the same rank they had before. For example, if they didn't participate in guild life for about a month, they would get less points. Jink thought that the girl was talking very fast and wanted to get it over with as soon as possible. After the guild, Jink decided to stretch himself in sword practice against dummies before dinner. Looking at the stats, he's more good at swordsmanship rather than sujutsu, especially since he has his class. The hero reflected that if he could always know his stats, his first life would have turned out very differently. Swinging his sword, Jink chopped the straw dummy with ease. Marveling at how light the 14-year-old's body was, he contemplated a parting gift for Esther. The hero has the skill of alchemy and enchantment along with his brother's blood. He decided that when he had eaten, he would do well for Esther. In the dining room of the mansion, Dezink's father, Gordon Nonland, reminded his son that this dinner was his last at this place, and that Dezink would have to leave as early as tomorrow morning. But with suspicious calmness, the son replied that he knew that. The father asked if the son had practiced fencing before. He replied that he had, and asked what was the matter. Gordon Nonland then did not continue to talk about it. Then Dezink said that he would already go to prepare for tomorrow morning. In the room, after laying out his clothes on the bed, the hero began to check the characteristics of the equipment after all, they should match his level. It turned out to be 27 points, and he had 25 points of physical strength. He calculated that if he put it all on, his physical strength would be 52. He thought about how effective it could be and how much fun he would have tomorrow. Dezink decided to drink a mana potion because despite the usefulness of the ability, it was tiring. The only thing left was a gift for Esther. He pondered what from the forge might be suitable for all the household goods had already been sold. Dezink looked at the spear. This spear had been given to him by his grandfather and it was made of mithril. It was exchanged for a gold bar, and the hilt was made from extra funds. The hero finally packed up and was ready to go. The next morning, he and Esther and Elser reached the western gate of the capital, further Dezink must go alone. For his brother's help, Dezink gave him a gift. It was a map and a box. The hero explained to Esther that he must later drop blood on this map and open the box when Dezink is out of the country. Elsa and Esther escorted Dezink out and asked him to be careful. He thanked them. When the hero said goodbye, Esther began to cry and shouted in a trail of admonitions for her brother to do well. Outside the gate, Dezink saw beautiful nature, mountains, grass, and sunshine. He decided that this was his true beginning. The hero began to work out the route on the map. A first to go to the border, two days to the postal town of Rio, go through the Berchere region, and then through the Mobitz Mark. This would take four days on foot. 
Normally, Jink would have to spend the night somewhere on the way to Rio, but right now it was too dangerous for him to be alone. He decided to test how far he could walk with the enchantment on physical strength. Unexpectedly, he started running at a tremendous speed, almost unable to see the road. It was better than Jink had expected. He concluded that he would reach his destination by the end of today. After an hour, the hero stopped. Despite running non-stop, he wasn't tired at all thanks to the enchantment skill. When he looked around, he noticed a broken cart, and around it dead bodies with knives and arrows inside. Dzink panicked for all his might trying to force himself to calm down. Suddenly two goblins swung at the hero from behind, one with an axe and the other with a dagger. Dzink immediately realized who had killed those people. He very quickly drew his sword and slew them in one move. Looking at the stats, he saw the index of their physical strength. It was level 8. The hero was very lucky that he was careful. Jink jumped up sharply, it appeared that he had avoided being hit by the new goblins that way. His body started moving before he could think. It was the power of enchantment. He swung and chopped the attackers with ease. Having dealt with the goblins, Dzink crouched down to rest. He was satisfied with the fight and the fact that he had been smart about leveling up. He thought about how being deported from this fallen country was even a good thing, that he would reach his goal thanks to these abilities. Jink could smell the blood of humans and monsters, it was the order of the day for this world. He put his hand to his chest and told the dead people to rest in peace. He had already calmed down a bit. In this world, looting after a monster attack is not a crime. Even if you don't touch them, still other monsters will come afterward and take their things. The hero thought about the fact that if he brought the family heirloom to the guild, he could get a reward as well as a thank you from the family of the deceased, and how he could get out of this country as soon as possible. Thinking back to the monster attack, Jink realized that he had to get used to cutting up monsters. He took out the magic stone from the goblin's heart, noting that the one who laughs is the one who doesn't end up being cut up. This stone is needed to prove that the goblin has been killed. You can earn money in the guild with it. Jink was scared to meet all the monsters, and on the way to Rio you can meet goblins and kobolds. But the hero has no problem with that. The next morning, the hero's level has increased. He can't improve weapons again if he has enchanted them once, which is why he took so many spare swords. His enchantment is at level 8. Jink added 8 to his sword swordsmanship and left his old sword as a spare. One hour later, he found himself in a forest east of the Mobbit's brand. This was where the adventurers were resting. No matter how hard the hero tried, today he would no longer be able to get to the Mobbit's brand city Mobbitsburg in time, so he would have to spend the night here today. While the hero was drinking the mana potion, he was interrupted by the shouts of the travelers. They were asking for someone to give the potion, their friend was dying. The man claimed that he could pay. To this a guy in the crowd said it was too expensive for them. Dzink responded to the continued pleas for help. He said he had the potion and asked how much they needed. They were surprised and pleased at his generosity. The hero realized that judging by the statistics, this was a company of not bad people, and he didn't want to watch someone die. The hero got the dying adventurer drunk while his friends watched and hoped for the best. Dzink wasn't that badly injured, so he hadn't tried the potion himself yet. He couldn't know for sure if it would help. But luckily the potion worked and the man woke up. His friends shouted with joy. A man approached the hero, introducing their group. They were from a paddy with the rank of Dragon Tears, and he himself was its leader. His name was Alexander, but he asked the hero to just call him Alec. Alec handed Dzink a bag of coins, saying that it was all they had, but it should be just enough for that potion. Dzink asked them first to tell him what had happened to them. It turned out that the group of men had the bad luck to encounter a red ogre, a monster of Ranke. Alex fell at Jink's feet, thanking him for saving his comrade, he said that he would repay the debt. Even if he had nothing more to give, he agreed to become a slave to the hero. All this was listened to by Alex's dumbfounded comrades and did not understand what was happening. The price of one bottle of potion is 5 gold coins, in terms of Japanese yen it will be 5 million. The hero could only dream of such financial power. Slavery was allowed in this world, but Jink didn't need it, so he asked Alex to stand up. Suddenly their conversation was interrupted by a whole crowd of huge ogres. Alex realized that they smelled blood, that's why they came here, and Dzink looked at the statistics. They were D rank, and their physical strength level was 29. The hero surpassed them in stats, so he didn't consider them a big problem, even though there were many ogres. 
One of the men said that after the Red Ogre, their group had run out of good weapons. Dzink didn't want his vault to be seen by anyone until he left the country. But the situation left no other solution. He took out many swords from the vault and gave them to a group of adventurers. They were very surprised because of the fact that he had a vault. The hero didn't have much trouble fighting the ogres, he cut off their limbs with quick swings of his sword and attacked them. The group of adventurers didn't expect him to be so strong and decided to join in as well. Jink decided to kill as many monsters as he could to gain more experience and not lose to the adventurers. But everyone except the protagonist fell to the ground from a huge gust of wind. It was the Orc General. Despite the fact that the monster had a B rank, Dzink didn't despair and decided to think of something. While Alex was swinging his sword, the hero had already started attacking the Orc General alone. Alex tried to call out to him, but Jink wasn't interested. He tried to strike with his sword, but the monster easily threw him back with his fist. The enchantment didn't help. Jink wondered if he had rushed to fight alone. A huge monster stood right in front of the hero. There was no telling what might have happened, but Alex struck the Orc General right in the side with his sword. By calling out to the monster, he was able to distract it. While the orc was distracted by Alex, preparing to attack him, Dzink jumped right above him, aiming for his neck. The blow hit the target perfectly, and the monster let out a horrified scream as the hero thrust his sword in as deep as possible. The general's head was severed, which meant he was defeated. Alex looked at all of this with astonishment. The remaining orcs retreated as their general was dead. Alex was amazed by Dzink's strength and asked what rank he was. To this, Dzink honestly said that he was still a rank G rookie and that he was able to win thanks to Alex. The hero also offered Alex to take the monster reward and refused the offer to split the reward equally. A crowd gathered around who recognized him. They said that he was from the Nonland family, that he had been deported. To this Dzink said that he was he, the fallen son of the Nonland family. People started talking about how he was different from the Dzink mentioned in the rumors. When things calmed down, the hero asked what Alex's plans were. He replied that their company was going to the royal capital after completing an escorting assignment, but before that they should stop by Mobitzburg. Suddenly Alex said that now he was Dzink's slave and would follow him anywhere. This was not in the hero's plans, but he was also holding a trip to Mobitzburg, so he asked permission to join their party for now. Dzink asked Alex for help. When their group is in the royal capital to give something to his brother Esther, then the slavery treaty will be over. Alex was surprised by the simplicity of the request and exclaimed what a good guy Dzink was and hugged him. An elf girl appeared on the horizon. There were two men standing next to the girl while she reasoned that Dzink was quite interesting. Along the way, the hero has already encountered an orc and now he keeps on his way to the distant city of Mobitzburg with a new team. Despite the name, there were no orcs to be seen and as it seemed there was nothing special in the forest. That's what the hero thought until a mob of little orcs appeared. The team immediately prepared for battle. Dzink shouted to the team to slaughter the orcs and moved into battle. His sword chopped in all directions, the orcs could not resist him. The others began to fight as well. Dzink could manage alone and didn't understand why they were wasting their strength. However, it might have been for experience points and money. Soon, all the orcs were defeated. To the hero, this fight seemed too easy. One of the fighters noticed that Dzink looked much worse than most, causing him to ask how he could do it. Dzink referred to his talent. He actually increases his physical strength with enchantments. The fighters started discussing some of the past battles while the hero was called out by unknown. There were three of them. The elven girl introduced herself as Karen, the leader of the Sacred Flame Paddy, and said that she had seen him defeat the Ogre General yesterday. The man said his name was Bogart and he had never seen the likes of Dzink. The other man couldn't believe he was so good with his weapons, then he had an assumption that Dzink was an enchanter. The man also introduced himself, his name was Will, he also offered to socialize. The hero introduced himself as well. He immediately decided to look at the stats of the three of them. It was a rank of party, nothing like that. Will had a weapon evaluation ability. Will said that his evaluation was inaccurate when he evaluated Dzink's weapon. Dzink agreed and asked how he knew that. Will replied that he saw an extra 8 to physical strength, and the hero has the ability to upgrade multiple items by the same level. Will again clarified whether Dzink was an enchanter. The crowd immediately became animated. There shouldn't have been any enchanters on this continent. The three offered to buy back the ability for a reasonable price. The hero agreed to the deal, 
but only on one condition. First, the skill owner must drip blood on the enchanted item, but it is imperative to do it correctly. The item must not be defiled by the hands of people with a questionable past. And also, the hero is now going to the Kingdom of Kahl through Mobitsburg, and he flatly refused to give that ability to anyone until he left this country. Will was completely satisfied with this condition, plus he said that he himself was from Kahl, and that they were happy to see the enchanter in this country. About the price, Dzink himself did not know what it should be, because he had never met any other enchanters. He invited Will to name his sum. Dzink explained his abilities. He could enchant swordsmanship at plus 8, sejutsu at plus 1, physical strength at plus 8, plus 3 courtesy, and plus 2 alchemy. He also has a 3 damage rating and a vault. He also has a scorecard. Will started shaking Jink, not understanding why he had such rare abilities. The hero replied that they were given to him from birth and asked what price Will was willing to give. In the end, Dzink enchanted Will's necklace for courtesy plus three and turned the bag into a magical bag. He enchanted Bogart's sword for fencing plus eight and Karen's earrings for alchemy plus two and shoes for physical strength plus eight. Now he should have dealt everyone cards with a score of three, but he looked exhausted. He had already started drinking the fifth bottle of mana potion, which surprised the adventurers, wondering if he was in a straight line. But Dzink said that everything was fine, and it was just that enchanting was taking a lot of mana. He did hand out cards to them, and told them to drop blood on them. Their cards did indeed show up on their cards. This card could only be used for skills, causing Will to offer an extra reward if Dzink told them about their extra qualities. Dzink explained that qualities, unlike skills, are indefinable, and some people have undeveloped qualities and talents. But he also said that he would be happy to be paid extra, because he didn't want to just help someone he didn't know. They ended up giving him a couple bags of gold, for which Dzink thanked them. Bogat said he was jealous of him, and will thought it all strange, because he is an enchanter, and a very important man, but for some reason travels alone. They guessed at once that he had been deported. Interrupting each other, the trio asked questions about what he had done, that he didn't look like a criminal, preventing Jink from explaining himself. Alex stood up for him. He said his friend wasn't like that and shouldn't be touched. The hero explained that he had simply behaved inappropriately and had been falsely accused. Dzink did not tell his family about these abilities. If they knew about it, they would start exploiting him. He has a small circle of people he can trust. Trinity and Alex listened intently to Dzink's story. In the end, he decided to go to the Coal Kingdom, but in doing so, he is even glad that he doesn't have many people close to him, it's for the best. Will stated that they would help Jink cross the border. Karen agreed with that. There are many varieties of monsters at the border, but Jink is strong of heart. With a smile on his face, the hero thanked them. Altogether, they set off on their journey, with not much left until Mobitsburg. The heroes reached the city. Dzink immediately realized that in this city, no one knows him. The money he earned from enchanting, he decided to spend on shopping in the city. He bought a lot of materials for forging and potions, and asked the vendor for the best weapons and armor. The vendor was pleased with such an ardent customer. He asked for smaller armor, and of the weapons he chose spears. The seller thought that Dzink was buying a gift for someone. The armor was red dragon skin, and the spear was simple but sturdy. The salesman said that only in his store could one find so many things. He asked if he needed help packing, and if the hero needed a big box for so much luggage. Dzink said that he had it all covered, meaning the storehouse. All of this was a gift for Esther. Just like that, these things couldn't last long, so the hero decided to enchant them as well as he could. He began the enchantment by constantly sipping on a bottle of mana. The next morning Dzink felt bad after the enchantment. The travelers were worried about his well-being. But he himself was not worried about it, and thankful that it would all be passed on to his brother. He also made scorecards and gave them to Alex as a thank you. Alex thanked him very much, but actually Dzink had earned experience points thanks to this, and his enchantment at this point was level 12. The heroes left the city and started to keep heading towards the border. At the same time, in the Nonland mansion, Esther sat alone in a small room remembering his brother. His father didn't think it was too strict, because Esther would be the heir to the Nonland house and should understand that. The father asked Esther if he would continue to behave inappropriately, whereupon he kicked his son in the stomach and he cried out in pain. The father promised to punish Esther, and when Dzink left tomorrow, he would not be allowed to go outside for 50 days. 
The elder Nonland gave his son a potion and then allowed him to see Dezink off, but after that they would not be brothers. While in the room and looking out the window, Dezink thought about what his brother was doing now, maybe wandering lonely in the forest. But the thoughts that ran through his mind were that he believed in his brother, that he would definitely be able to get away alive from this country. At this time, Dezink and the other adventurers were fighting huge ogres. The hero also remembered his brother and wanted to be an example to him in this fight. From the heroes fought harmoniously, killing the monsters one by one. From above came a bunch of small ogres, but even with them, the team easily coped. Most of the heroes wielded their swords, while Karen shot off the monsters with her bow. Will used the Wind Slasher ability, which killed the orcs by itself. Dezink had actually seen what an a rank was. Will encouraged him that through enchanting, he would soon raise his own rank. The hero began to think about magic, that he couldn't even create forest fire, and he should also improve in the direction of magic. The rest of the monsters fled, and the heroes continued on their way. The closer they got to the border, the more monsters they encountered. It turns out that it's impossible to get to the border if you're a low-ranked merchant or adventurer. Karen pointed out that a C-rank adventurer was unlikely to get here, and if a merchant wanted to cross the border, he would hire a B-rank or hire convoy. And deep in the forest lives a dragon-like wyvern. Sometimes she appears near the road, some hires even ask to catch her. Jink immediately decided that he didn't want to meet a wyvern. Karen said that there was no need to worry because the border was already near. The heroes reached the border town of Colt. It is said that no one survived after crossing the border. Dezink hoped that no problems would arise. Karen reassured the hero, saying that they would help him in case of anything. Will and Bogart were a level and Karen was his level, and she is of noble blood. There are Viscounts serving in the local guard, so it's all good. Dezink hoped that physical force wouldn't have to be used, and he could cross the border without repercussions. The knights called the team for inspection, and one of the knights asked to see identification. While inspecting Jink, the knights immediately realized who he was. The hero admitted that it was really him, and that he had lost his status and had become a commoner. The knight heard that Jink had left the capital only five days ago, and pondered how he was able to arrive at the border so quickly. Karen interrupted the knights, saying that they had arrived by carriage, and that this child was simply told to leave, which he did, that she didn't understand what problems there could be with that. The knight was indignant that a commoner could talk to him like that, but seeing the S rank on her card, he was immediately frightened. Karen, attacking, rebuked the knight for being rude. The guard immediately ran away apologizing and promised to call a superior. Will declared that next time it would be him who would speak. The superior knight appeared. He apologized for his subordinate and promised to punish him. He began to argue about why the heroes went to such a disgraceful kingdom of Rosalta. They are from the kingdom of Colt, and in Rosalta live only untalented people. It was at this time that Jink remembered him. He served a convoy, was blinded by his status, and tried to poison the head of the family. The hero felt he was an extra. Will explained that they were escorting Dezink because he had been deported and ordered to leave the country within a certain time and not return, so there was no reason to detain him. But it seemed suspicious to the knight that the hero had gotten here so quickly. Will went on to say that their team had accompanied Dezink for three days and no suspicious behavior had been seen behind him, and since he was able to arrive in five days from the capital, he was able to. The knight had nothing to object and agreed that since the hero was able to get here, then all was well. He apologized for taking up the hero's time and promised to be more careful in the future at the inspection of aristocrats. Walking further, the heroes saw a view of the city. From here, the kingdom of Kol begins. Finally, Dezink reached the border. The hero thanked his traveling companions for their help. Without them at the guard's inspection, he would have fared worse. Will replied that it was nonsense. Will asked Dezink if he had thought about how he would react in the kingdom of Rosalt if they found out he was an enchanter. He might be forced to return or killed, either way, they wouldn't leave him alone. Will offered to raise Jink's rank in the Adventurer's Guild. It's not like he doesn't have a registration to work. The fact that he's an enchanter will help him. Will continue to reason that since the hero has such a rare ability, the guild should be willing to give him protection. If he registered in Cole, he wouldn't be able to conduct business in Rosalt. Dezink agreed that it was better to secure himself in advance. The travelers decided to go to the guild now. Will said that he would tell the guild himself. He decided to make a bracelet with a healing effect for Karen, or rather practice with it. 
She wanted to say that she didn't need it, but she thanked Will without finishing the sentence. The heroes entered the guild. All the guild visitors became animated when they saw Karen. They discussed that she was as beautiful as ever, but they didn't understand who that guy was with her and why she was so friendly with him. The travelers were met by an assistant. He greeted the adventurers and asked what they were interested in today. Will asked for a certificate of occupation and to increase D. Sinka's rank. The assistant said to take a look at his loot by coming to the back of the guild, to which D. Zink asked for a bigger seat. The assistant was surprised, but they stopped there. They would have to start with the goblins. D. Zink brought a whole bag of them. The assistant grumbled at the newcomers why he needed a corpse in a sack. The second assistant explained that you don't need the whole corpse to prove killing monsters. D. Zink dumped a huge amount of goblin ears out of the sack, adding that he had 10 more sacks of kobold and slug parts. The assistants were perplexed as to how he could have gathered all this alone, but D. Zink also added that he had not yet dismembered a few orcs. He opened a vault from which monster corpses fell in great numbers. The assistants could only say that he had a rather capacious vault. They were terribly surprised. The assistant got busy counting. It ended up with seven mage bodies, six goblin shamans, goblins 812, one orc general, 119 orcs. With the deduction of the dismemberment fee, 24 gold coins and three gold bars came out. Jink began to convert the currency into yen again and enjoyed the sum of three million yen, having dreamed of such a sum in a past life. What remained was the rank increase. While some adventurers at the table were discussing Jink's huge kill count, the hero learned that he had gained enough points for rank C. But to get rank D or higher you have to pass a test. D Zink asked to talk more about the test. It turned out that if the traveler was a swordsman, he would need to go through sparring with the examiner. The exam could be taken right away. D Zink gladly agreed. The girl led the hero into the arena, and his friends decided to attend as well. So far, he was alone in the arena, and there were spectators sitting in the stands. One of them recognized D Zink. He had seen him at the guard's inspection and knew he was the fallen refugee from Rosalt. A young man appeared behind the hero's back. He introduced himself. It was the head of the guild. His name was Snow. He would be the hero's sparring partner. The passersby, having learned that the guild head would be the examiner, were gathering in the stands. The head asked his friend who the opponent would be. He replied that the young man had killed a hundred orcs himself. The guild leader couldn't believe it. Snow warned Jink that he might get crippled during the fight or seriously injured. At this time in the stands, D. Zink was cheered on by his friends, especially Karen, shouting that the hero would make it through and if anything, she would be able to heal him. At the time, other spectators were jealous of Jink, wishing Karen could heal them as well. They supported Snow to kill the hero. The exam had begun. Jink just stood there, preparing his sword. The examiner decided to go on the offensive first. Snow swung his sword sharply, but Jink managed to dodge, and the examiner only slashed his cloak. The guild leader was surprised at this speed. Snow tried several more times to wound D. Zink, but nothing worked. But he managed to step on the hero's foot. Snow took advantage of this and threw a punch. Karen was scared for the hero. It became clear to Will why exactly Snow was the head of the guild. At this time, Karen's fans cheered and a few drops of blood dripped into the arena. A cut appeared on Jink's cheek. It was his first time fighting a human with swords. Monsters were no match. Snow noticed that usually sparring didn't last more than three minutes, and the hero hadn't lost his fighting spirit yet. The guild leader hadn't had that for a long time. This time, it was Jink who threw the first punch. He almost managed to hit Snow, but he tripped him and his sword went almost at his head, but didn't hit. D. Zink didn't give up. After looking at the examiner's characteristics, he realized why he had fencing at level 104. If one made a mistake, he would immediately take the initiative. If Dzink hesitated, he would immediately get hit, and Snow knew how to enjoy it. In the stands, the young man said that the fight had just begun, and the hero was already wounded. The girl objected that the boy is still not bad, he has to move a lot, there is not even time to take a break. At this time, Karen thought that even Jinku couldn't defeat the guild head. Regardless, he is only a human, he should also have a limit of endurance. Jink saw Snow using different techniques. All of his actions are precise and formulaic, as if from a textbook. The hero's awe he had before him as a veteran and experienced fighter began to fade. He decided that he could hit. Snow didn't think the fight would last this long, but he believed that it would be over soon anyway. Jink's swordsmanship level is 27. 
Normally he wouldn't be useful in this fight, but he has an enchantment. The hero clearly decided to attack without fear. Snow tried to strike again, but Dzink dodged very cleverly. Snow hesitated. The hero took advantage of such a moment and struck a blow right into the examiner's side, cutting him quite badly. The hero's friends were overjoyed. Snow was surprised by this outcome. He put his palm to the cut and saw blood on his hand. He gave up and recognized Dzink's victory. The people in the stands were puzzled, not understanding how someone like him could win. It was the first time they had seen Snow defeated. Dzink didn't understand their amazement. Karen ran up to the head of the guild to heal him, but he refused, saying that he had enough potion. The hero realized that Snow was in shock, for he had lost to a child. Karen playfully stated that then heal Jink as a prize. He, embarrassed, said he wasn't particularly hurt, but she healed him anyway. Karen's fans were really pissed off by this. Will also approached the heroes, saying that the boy had defeated the so-called genius cult and the head of the guild. Will really asked to tell the hero his secret. This frightened Dzink a little, he said it was all thanks to enchantment. Will shouted loudly that it was understandable, because the hero won thanks to his enchantment ability, so everything was fair, and asked what his swordsmanship level was. Dzink replied that it was 175. Snow was shocked. There were only three such enchanters in the world. It turns out that the hero was the fourth of them. Will stated that the boy's abilities were now part of the sacred flame, and he also had the ability to evaluate. As proof, he showed the guild leader the card that Jink used to evaluate Will's abilities. In support of Snow, Dzink told him that without the enchantment, he would not have won. The guild leader changed in his face and cheerfully said that he just put in little effort and that would be a lesson to him. He said that as the guild head, he was assigning Jink the profession of enchanting and appraisal. Will congratulated the hero on being promoted to preliminary C rank. Dzink was pleased at first, and then, after thinking about it, clarified what preliminary meant. Will cheerfully replied that enchanters could easily increase their rank to S. If a person with that ability stayed with a low rank, it would be bad for everyone. It's just a safety measure. Dzink was angry about having to take the test, even though he appeared to be able to easily raise his rank, to which Will countered that there were reasons. Such a rare profession was a most indispensable human resource, and if Dzink couldn't protect himself on his own, he would be provided with an escort. Wherever he went, he would be escorted. The hero did not like such a thing. Will explain that this was the reason why his fighting ability had to be evaluated. Also for this reason, there are a lot of people here. Unexpectedly, Dzink asked why Will was helping him. At first, the man was surprised. His explanation was simple. He just wondered what would happen to the hero after he left the country. The boy asked what would happen if he used his abilities. Will replied that given his enchanting and appraisal abilities, he might be able to reach SS rank. Dzink was inspired by this idea. He decided that SS rank sounded good. The character thought that S was the highest rank, but Will explained that it wasn't. If a person has SS rank, then no one has power over him. One can be on the same level as the masters of castles or country. Jink has a lot to experience, Will asked if he wants to achieve that. He had survived deportation, scorn, escape from Roosevelt. He clenched his hand into a fist. Dzink was riding in a carriage and solving problems, pondering which formula to use in them. Monsters appeared from the forest. The carriage companions started fighting them. Dzink immediately decided to help. This was a great chance to test his skills in water magic. He formed a huge water ball in his hand and sent them straight into the wolves. Nothing came out. They just got wet without taking any damage. Jink had to run away from them for a bit. He decided to concentrate, remembering his training. It wasn't just water, it had to be as heavy and fast as a lead ball. He gathered the water in his palms again. With a shout, he sent the water ball into the monsters. This time he managed to kill a few, and at the end, the ball even damaged the tree behind the monsters. The rest of them were frightened. This allowed the guards to attack them with spears. After defeating the monsters, Jink was happy with the power of enchantment, water magic had been with him since the beginning. He thought that he needed to be more careful when he aimed, that he might have let the other people down. They in turn apologized for interfering with Jink's studies, thinking they should guard him better. Jink asked them not to worry, saying that it was a training in magic for him. At this time, he was preparing for the exam, heading to the capital of the Kingdom of Karl. The narrative shifts to two weeks ago, right after the test. Bogart met the hero and his friends outside some rich house, saying that everything was ready. 
Dezink inquired what the place was, to which Will explained that it was Count Brando's mansion and they would be staying here tonight. Jink didn't really like aristocrats. Will reassured him that Count Brando was quite famous and different from those aristocrats who thought they were better than others. He also took care of Will when he was little. Bonding with such a man is not a bad idea. The maid called the heroes into the room, calling the hero Mr. Jink, which was unusual for him. The owner of the mansion said hello to the hero and then introduced himself as the Earl of the Kingdom of Call, Nicholas Brando. He said to contact him if he needed anything. Dezink said that despite his S rank, there was still a lot he didn't know how to do, so he asked not to be called Mr. Just Dezink. Nicholas Brando remarked that the hero was very polite and said it was a pleasure to meet him. The heroes found themselves at a table with a very delicious meal. Count Brando told the hero and the other guests to enjoy the food and Dezink wished them a pleasant appetite. After the canned food from the camp, this food was very tasty for the hero. The Count told the boy that he had successfully escaped from Rosalt and asked what he planned to do next. Jink replied that he wanted to get far away from the kingdom of Rosalt, travel to the kingdom of Kal and increase his rank, and eventually, after Kal, settle in the kingdom of Yamato. Then Count Brando suggested him to go to Koralt, the capital of the kingdom. There is the most prestigious of the prestigious high schools in the kingdom of Kal. Although it's hard to get in, but Jink should be able to make it. After that, Mano entered the high school in Yamato Kingdom. The hero thought about the fact that he was only 14 years old and he was unexpectedly able to get his rank early. The landlord said that rank S could be considered an aristocratic status and even if the hero went to Yamato, he would still have to worry about people from Rosalt getting to him. Jink replied that he didn't want to stay in one place for long but wanted to see the world and have many new experiences. Count Brando said that if he gained experience, he would just have to go to the nearby town of Gamel. Dezink remembered what he knew about this city. It is built right above the largest dungeon of the Coal Kingdom. It is 80 stories deep. No one has ever been able to reach the lowest point of the dungeon. Monsters of all different sizes keep appearing there. It's a real adventure. Karen remarked that if the hero wanted to enter the school, he would have to pass the entrance exams. Dezink replied that everything will be fine and he will study while traveling to Coralt. Karen was surprised at the hero's determination, saying that she was not very good at reading. Count Brando suggested that the boy be introduced to some adventurer's Paddy as he traveled toward the capital. He would be passing through the territory of aristocrats familiar to the Count. He allowed Jink to stop at his mansion in Coralta and introduce himself on his behalf. At the end, he asked how the hero liked the idea and what he thought. Count Brando's son was a close age to Jink, and he too was thinking of taking the exam. The landlord hoped that the boy could befriend him if possible. The hero wasn't used to this, and he felt a little uncomfortable. In Jinkiro's memory, every day was similar to the previous one, but now he was overflowing with enthusiasm, constantly learning something new. The boy thanked Count Brando and agreed to his proposal. He also thanked his friends from the Sacred Flame. It was a pleasure for them to do business with him. They planned to meet up with Dragon's Tears and return to Rosalt, and when they settled things with his brother, they would return to Coralt. Then maybe the heroes would meet again. Dezink hoped his friends would be alright. Thus, the hero went there and is happy about it. But Jinkiro didn't have to agonize like this. When he was a guest at the aristocrats' mansion he studied, after the battle with the monsters he studied at the camp. The aristocrats who sheltered the hero received an enchanted item and a scorecard from him for his hospitality, and Jink kept learning and learning. From the carriage, the hero heard that he had to get out for an inspection. He arrived at Coralt. The hero even cried out at how big the city was. Those walls were twice as big as the walls of the royal capital of Rosalt. He immediately wanted to walk around the city. The guard said that just walking around the city was not allowed for the boy because if something happened to him, all his guards would be finished. Dezink was a little upset. The knight asked the hero to have a little patience until he passed the entrance exam and now they should go to the mansion. The hero found himself at Brando's mansion. He was met by Nicholas Brando's wife, her name was Aria, and his son, whose name was Chris. Aria told Jink welcome and also called her Mr. Chris said he heard about the hero from his father. The boy said he wanted to enroll in school within a month and asked to just call him by his first name. It was a bit awkward for him. Aria replied that she couldn't offer much hospitality, but asked the hero to make himself at home. Chris wanted to show Jinku the house right away, but Aria said he must be tired from the long trip. The hero said he was fine. 
Chris then said to follow him. For all the pluses of the hero's strength, there is one weakness. He was terribly overworked, having reached the limit of his endurance. He fell to his knees, almost blowing steam from his head. Chris and Arya were terrified for him. At this time, the king and Cole learned that an enchanter had come to their kingdom. It was reported to him that the hero wanted to enter Call High School. Puzzled, the king asked to know more about him. Chris shouted with a request to take Jink to the infirmary, while the hero himself was exhausted but glad that he had achieved the maximum grade level of 10. Dzink sat at a desk in a large auditorium. The entrance exams for the magic department of the Call Kingdom High School had begun. The hero had heard that it was very difficult to enter here. In Japan, this exam wouldn't be so difficult. The hero recalled how he fainted from how much he studied. But he was able to increase his magic experience. Even though it looked terrible, the people in the mansion took care of him. At this time, the other disciples didn't realize how easily Jinx solved matters. The written part of the exam was over, the magic practice test was next. The examiner told the students to show all they could. The exam will evaluate the type and rarity of the students' abilities. It was the turn of S-rank adventurer Mr. Jink. He was number 783. He was surprised that they even addressed the applicants with the word Mr. The other kids were shocked that the hero had rank S. They wanted to know where he was from, how he would do in the exam. Jink decided to use magic to attack, but he wondered how they would rate the enchantment. One of the examiners showed the boy to Mr. Penham. The man said that the hero had the skill of enchanting and evaluating magic. Jink looked at his characteristics and it all made sense to him. He also had the evaluation skill. Penham said that the hero was not very good at water magic. The others had a small healing skill. The boy was uncomfortable being the object of evaluation. Penham asked the hero to demonstrate his water magic, to which he immediately agreed. First, he gathered a water balloon in his hands. The exam was over and Chris marveled at what had happened. He was saying how cool the water cyclone had come out and how great it had been. In the exam, Dzink had splashed everyone by overdoing it because of the enchantment. He didn't know if he'd be deducted points because of it. In any case, this Marquis of Penham is a rather high-ranking aristocrat, and if that was the case, he could tell the king about the hero. At this time, Penham was at the king's reception. He was telling the king that the boy had passed the written part of the exam with 96%, which was quite good, it was rare for anyone to achieve such results, and that in his opinion, the hero could get into the first class of the magic faculty. The others at the table were perplexed at how he could say that, after all Jink was still a child. Panam wanted to address the king, but the king interrupted him, saying that he understood his concern, but asked what about humanity? And that Dzink is an enchanter, everyone in Rosalt will find out faster than he thought. The king clarified with Panam how the examination with the hero had gone. The one replied that it was good, and in addition to enchanting, he also has swordsmanship and physical strength. He also has a large vault. The king, Nomal Kal, understood everything. He had heard about Dzink trying to poison his father. If a man with such power became a villain, it would be a threat to Kal. Panam replied that there was no need to worry, and from his evaluation ability, he didn't see the hero as a sinner. Also, Shijutsu skills are extremely low for a descendant of the Nanlands, and after all, the family is famous for their spear-wielding skills. As for the Fallen One, perhaps he was accused and banished undeservedly in Rosalta. Outside the doors, other people were eavesdropping on the conversation. Nomal Cole didn't like Dzink being an aristocrat and a man with power anyway. He was exiled because of his inability to use a spear, or there might have been other reasons in Rosalt. It was easy to find out. The king realized that he was banished in Rosalt without knowing that he was an enchanter. The king asked for a place to be prepared. He decided that his country would become a haven for the enchanter Dzinka, that they would use his abilities for their own benefit. A few days later, Dzink received the results. Chris was very happy that Dzink got a passing grade. This time, only three people were able to get into the first class. The hero didn't realize how he passed, even though he wet everyone. He in turn congratulated Chris for getting into second grade. Chris heard from his mom that the hero had been invited to an audience from the king and asked if he had a ceremonial outfit since he had only seen the hero in regular clothes. Dzink though a former aristocrat, but he traded all his belongings for deportation funds. Creating a scorecard for aristocrats brought money, so Jink decided to go to the city to shop. 
the residents for the incoming arrivals, Aka the base for exploring the labyrinth underground, and also searching for human resources. At the slave factory, Jink was introduced to the top 10 slaves. Buying and selling slaves is normal here, but it was still unfamiliar to the hero. He asked for someone with level B or higher. The slave owner at first said there were no such people, but then he found a blonde-haired girl. He suggested this girl Jinka. Her name was Nina, and she was 12 years old. She was going to be sold as a salt woman, but as she was being brought in, a pack of dogs attacked her and bit her, so now she was being sold as a mere slave. The man asked if the hero liked her and put a price of one gold coin and three silver coins. Dzink agreed and bought Nina. Needing to make the sale, Dzink had to put a drop of his blood on the girl's neck. He did. The man began to recite the words of the ritual. A mark appeared on Nina's neck. After the ritual was completed, the girl fell at Jink's feet and said that from today she was her master's slave and that he could use her as he wished, to which the hero called her to go. The man thanked the hero for the purchase. Jink and Nina arrived at Count Brando's house. He thought to ask the girl and decided to find out where she was from. She said that she was born into a poor farmer's family, they ran out of money in the winter, so they sold her as an extra mouth. Dzink said that this may be a common story, but it was not an easy decision for her parents. Nina went on to say that the new dad said she was abandoned. Dzink saw that the girl was uncomfortable with the story and decided that the questioning was enough. He thought about the fact that her father had gotten rid of her too, just as he had once gotten rid of him. He gave Nina five orders. To always agree with him, not to harm him, not to lie to him, not to leak information about him, and not to do anything that would be directed against him. The hero said that if the girl does not break these rules, she could very well be free. Even though she was a slave, he did not want to use her for evil purposes. He said that he would not punish her for being rude or making a mistake, and that if she had questions, let her ask. She then asked permission to ask one thing. Nina said she had a scar and asked if she should work better at night. Dzink was surprised, asking if she knew what night work was. Nina replied that she knew and had heard about it. The hero tried to end this conversation and explained that this was not why he bought the girl, to which she said that she can only help so much. She can't do physical work, she can't write or read. She was always told that only night work was her purpose and she was born for that. Dzink held out a bottle to Nina. She asked what it was, to which the hero replied that it was a potion and to begin with it was to cure her wound. He said that you can't cure a wound with an ordinary potion. Nina was very surprised, for you can't give a slave to give such a thing, but the boy ordered her to drink. He said that the girl deserved it and told about his skill of evaluating other people. He explained that he chose Nina because she had a talent for cooking. The other skills were not so good, but they could be improved. Dzink said he had a request and he needed her strength. He asked Nina to give Nina a bath after her wound healed, and then the hero will prepare new clothes for her Nina wanted to ask something, but Chris interrupted her by asking if there was anything he could do to help, to which the hero replied that yes. Nina cried, clutching the potion bottle in her hand. Nina thanked her new master. Dzink and Chris were talking in the mansion's courtyard. Chris asked if Dzink had brought this Nina with him. Just like the hero said, she is good at cooking, her hands move with incredible speed. Chris said that even their maid was surprised, everyone was very full. Dzink agreed, looking at his stuffed belly. The hero used alchemy to turn unnecessary things into ingots and get money. Chris asked why he needed so much money, to which he said he would need more slaves. Suddenly Nina showed up and wanted to know more about it, also mentioning that she had made the hero some cookies. After the treatment and in her new maid's clothes, she looked happy. Nina handed Jink a jar of cookies, asking her to tell her later if the heroes liked them. Chris, admiring the girl, noticed how she looked good in her maid's uniform. But Dzink decided to continue the conversation by asking Chris if he knew where he could buy battle slaves, since they were not in the factory where Nina was. After thinking for a moment, Chris replied that it was possible to find them in the so-called prisoner sales agencies. That's where slaves are found criminals. Dzink came to the dormitory of Call High School. He felt like there was too much space for him alone, but if he brought Nina there, it should be quite comfortable. He also didn't forget that he needed battle slaves. All in all, the hero would still need a lot of things, and for that, he needed money. The hero met Chris. He said that classes would start today. The heroes were in different classes, and Jink might not have to take some classes since he has them for credit. 
It would just be weird not going to class from the first day. D-Zinc was noticed by a group of girls who recognized him. They had heard that he was in first grade and an S-rank adventurer. They decided that the rumors about him were true and he was really handsome. The girls wanted to know if he had a fiance. They thought he was too good for them and were willing to be his mistress. D-Zinc tried not to react to this. Chris was amused by this and asked if the hero was too noisy. He replied that it was as if he hadn't left Rosalt and he didn't like it. Chris genuinely didn't understand why. The hero explained that they were not interested in him, but in his status, and the engagement would bring him nothing, and it was a great benefit to them. Chris whispered that they appear to be of low origin, which is why they are so desperate, because their future depends on it. Dezink told the girls that if they wanted money, let them go and kill some monsters. Magic doesn't care if you're a man or a woman. Besides, there are plenty of jobs that take women. Why don't they try to reach the heights themselves instead of relying only on other people's wallets? The heroes continued their conversation until they met another girl. She turned to Jink. It was Najenda Cole from the first class politics department. She was also a freshman. Hero was a little shy, and as he repeated her name, he was very surprised to ask if she was a princess. Immediately, she and Chris started bowing, and Jink asked how she had been doing these two years. No one at school knew they knew each other. Najenda said that everything was fine and asked to treat her as a classmate. The hero said that now he is an adventurer, and this is the first year of his adventures, they might not see each other much. The princess revealed that she was now on her way to do her father's business. Since coal is a big country, the royal duties are not easy. Suddenly, the heroes heard someone's conversation. The boy was addressing Mr. Blog, saying that this is all there is for this month. The bullies were telling this boy that it was time to pay for their friendship, and this month's payment was too small. The boy replied that this month had been hard. Blog then started threatening to show what would happen to the boy if they were not friends. He said that the boy wants his friend to be from the Heriogra family. Jink asked Najenda who that was. She replied that Blog is the heir to the Randozel family. During his middle school days, he thought he could do whatever he wanted. Many people were even expelled because of him. The hero asked how then he could get into high school if he was from the third grade. The girl replied that Blog's father had tried his best. There was no proof and even her family members couldn't do anything about it. The bully approached the heroes saying hello to Mrs. A and Agenda. She asked him what just happened, but he replied that he was just having a conversation with a friend. Jink intervened in the conversation, asking to speak to this young man. Blog asked if he was the same D Zink, to which the hero replied in the affirmative. Blog stated that he wanted to hire the hero and use his S rank to the maximum, Aka Commoner, would be able to use the Randozol family name. This pissed Jink off terribly, he even remembered his father. Blog didn't like his silence, and with questions if his hero was listening, he reached out his hand to him. The hero immediately threw his hand away, telling him not to touch him. Blog stated that Jink had hit him, so this commoner would definitely regret it, especially since he started first and Blog is skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He had already swung his fist, but the hero was already the first to hit him in the face. Blood came out of Blog's nose. Nijenda and Chris were surprised. The bully was very angry and asked if the hero hadn't read the school principles. To this, Jink replied that in this school, it doesn't matter who you are, what family you come from or what class you are from, it doesn't matter whether you are a nobleman or a commoner. It doesn't matter if you're from first class or third class, no one can manhandle. Jink shouted that Blog was no longer in his middle school. All of this made the bully cry, holding his nosebleed with his hand. Dzink called for Najenda and Chris to go from there. Chris said that if Blog even looked at him, he would be scared by now, and the hero was worried that it didn't come out nicely. Najenda told him not to worry. She remembered that Jink had gotten an invitation from her father. She said it wasn't necessary, but it would be nice if he went. The hero said he would be honored, but remembered that he doesn't have a formal costume, and he can't buy one since he is saving for other things. Najenda said that was fine for an adventurer, and agreed to give him a new cloak. The hero thanked her. A few days later, Dzink came for an audience. The king was sitting on the throne, and he thanked the hero for coming. He introduced himself as the king of the kingdom of Kol Namil, and said he was glad to meet. The hero replied that he was honored. The king said that it had come to his attention that noblemen often asked to make Jink a scorecard, and it must not be easy. The hero replied that it was not that difficult, and he had received rewards for it. 
Since that was the case, the king asked for the use of enchantment and appraisal for him. Jinx said that he would be only too happy to help, thinking about finally using his enchantment for official work. The king mentioned that Nejenda had told of an incident with a child of the Randozel family, and asked if the hero thought it was sloppy on his part. The boy replied that he knew someone similar to this blog. Noma was surprised. Dzink said that this is a person who shows strength and asserts himself at the expense of the weak. No one likes him, and he cannot forgive such a person. He said that it may be too early, but he is ready to accept any punishment. The king replied that it was all right, and he just wanted to test Jink, and he himself and Nejenda did not care about Block. The king concluded that the hero would not use enchantment with malicious intent. About the school, the boy did well. The king offered him a gift and asked him what he would like. After thinking about it, he thanked the king and asked to have the right to buy slaves from the prisoner slave selling agency. The king asked why prisoner slaves. The hero said that he buys slaves to explore the underground labyrinth of Gamel. He wants to expand his capabilities, so he brings in talented people. The king was surprised and asked why the hero was choosing slaves. The hero explained that if he hires adventurers and servants, spies from Rosalt might slip in, and he really does it for his own safety. He agreed, saying that Dzink is a wise man and is not what they say he is, adding that he would like to be a friend to him. Dzink and Mina went to the prisoner slave agency. The guards confirmed the hero's authorization. He said that many good slaves could be found here. He told Nina that it wasn't necessary to go with him, it wasn't a good place, but she disagreed, saying it was an important experience. They walked down the corridor along the cells where the prisoners were. Nina was scared, she clasped Jink's arm tightly around her, but he himself was calm. Nina asked the gentleman in surprise if he was scared. He replied that it was not the first time for him. He recalled a moment from the past when he had to choose slaves. Back then he had said he liked anyone, he was told they would give it to him when he was done using it himself. The hero was still sickened by such memories. Jink noticed an emaciated guy sitting on the floor. He was combative and had almost reached his ceiling. The hero said he wanted to talk to him. The guard agreed and ordered Ian to stand up. The hero asked Jan what he had done that he was accused of murder. The prisoner said that he was the son of a rich merchant, he had a bad relationship with his father's second wife, and she decided to get rid of him. He then attacked her with a knife during the conflict. Dzink thought it was self-defense. Nina noticed that Jan was very expensive, costing 53 platinum coins. Jink was dumbfounded as it was like 5-2 million Japanese yen. Dzink pondered that Yan's stats were already good, and if he bought him, it would become even better. He thought about how many scorecards he would need to make, and would need a lot of space and equipment. The guard asked if the hero would buy it since he was an aristocrat and should have enough money. Despite being an accident, he's a murderer, so aristocrats and merchants won't take him. Ian said that his father tried to buy him back, but the price is ten times more for relatives, so it is not easy, no matter how much money his father has. Jan said that he can't face his family. Nina told Jink with a smile that Yan is not scary like others. Unexpectedly to the prisoner, Dzink said he was buying it. Dzink wondered if his majesty would give him the mansion. Chris laughed at what the hero was waiting for. His mom was just talking to the royal family. Dzink asked if the conversation was about the Brando Land family and said that nerves gave him a stomach ache. Chris also got requests to create a scorecard, which the hero thanked him for. Nina is learning to read and write, as well as practicing cooking. She now knows how to cook orc meat. Dzink thought that if you don't think about it being orc, it's pretty tasty. Ian is practicing magic and swordsmanship at this time, his stats are increasing. He is practicing with a sword from the Yamada Kingdom, it was hard to find. Jink notices that sometimes Yang looks like he's thinking about something, even though the hero told him not to worry about anything. He decides to talk to him while they go shopping. The hero calls Jan into town, to which he immediately agrees. As they walked down the busy street, someone in a hood and cloak followed them from around the corner. Dzink and Jan were walking through the city. The hero explained to Jan that the potion and antidote were in a box, and where the food was, as well as he asked to check the number of weapons and equipment. Jan agreed to do so. Dzink reminded Jan to ask questions if there were any, otherwise the party would fail and they might get lost. Suddenly someone called out to the hero. A hooded young man shouted that stop using his brother and asked to release him right now, threatening to attack him. The hero immediately realized that it was Yang's younger brother. 
Looking at his characteristics, Jink thought about how sad everything was, learning that it was Ian's abandoned brother and that his name was Ash. Jink calmly spoke that he was detaining an S-rank royal adventurer, adding that he didn't advise him to do so. The hooded boy asked not to show off, saying that he would defeat the hero and get his brother back. Dzink got angry, saying he was his official owner, especially since Jan cost him 53 platinum coins. The boy was almost the same age as the hero, but didn't realize it. Suddenly pulling himself together, Yan turned to Jink. Falling at the feet of the hero, he asked for forgiveness for his brother, saying that he was a fool and asked him to punish him, but not to touch his brother. Ash was surprised by this. He shouted asking for it to stop and asked his brother how he could bow at the hero's feet, saying he didn't like it. A crowd gathered at the shouting. Jink thought he looked like a villain. Jan asked Ash if he hated him since he had killed his mother and mother-in-law. Ash replied that he felt like punching him for that, but what he hated most was that his brother had turned into a slave even though he was smarter and better. Ash wanted such a brother to come back to him. His father said he would find the money and get Jan out, but Dzink bought him before. Then Jink told Jan that his brother had already said it was pointless, so taking the sword out of storage, he said he would become Ash's opponent since he wanted it so much. Jan wanted to say something to the hero, but Ash with shouts that Dzink had asked for it already ran with his spear at the hero. Dzink deftly dodged the blow. While Ash was attacking, the hero managed to chop his spear into pieces, only small wooden sticks were left of it. Ash was frustrated, and Jink swung right at him in a leap. The hero swung his sword straight through the hero's entire body. Ian was scared for his brother, but the boy actually just cut the cloak. Ash fell backwards. Dzink asked if he wanted more, to which the boy only called him an asshole. Suddenly men from the adventurer's guild appeared and twisted Ash around. One of them turned to the hero, asking if he was alright after being attacked by the townsfolk. Ash at this time shouted out requests to let him go. Jink realized that these were guild men. The men apologized, saying that they had just heard from the guild and asked if the hero could go with them. He agreed, thinking that he should take the shopping home. Then he asked Ian to return without him, adding that they would talk at home. Jan tensed at this. When Dzink returned, he was met by Nina shouting. Nina asked the hero to stop Jan. When asked what was wrong, she replied that Jan was about to die. The hero called out to the slave and rushed into the room. When the hero saw Jan, he noticed that he was holding a dagger right at his throat. Jink was frightened and asked what the man was doing, then ran to take the dagger away. Yong asked to let him die for this disrespect of his relative. Jink shouted asking him to calm down, saying that if Yong died, he had wasted 53 billion yen. The dagger fell to the floor. Yong asked the hero to punish him, adding that he deserved it. Jink at this time fell to his knees from exhaustion. He said that tomorrow they would go to the labyrinth, he would have to explore the labyrinth, guard it and ride with the horses, so he asked not to denigrate the situation. Jan was surprised that the hero would leave it like that. Dzink said it was better than dying and asked not to be AWOL until he ordered it. Jan thanked the hero, saying he would work as hard as he could. Nina ran into the room wondering if the hero would let Jan die. Dzink reassured her, saying that it was okay and that he had already forgiven him. Nina was overjoyed. Jan wanted to ask Dzink about Ash, but the hero immediately said that he would have to reflect on his behavior in the guild cell, but he would not be executed. Jan thanked Dzink, adding that his mother-in-law spoiled him and he needs to be looked after, but he is his brother and dear to him. The hero pondered these words, repeating them. Jan asked if he had a brother too. The boy answered in the affirmative and that his name was Esther, but that he did not act that way. Standing in the room, he wondered how his brother was doing. At this time Esther was at Elsa's bedside, asking her for some food. He assured her that his brother was probably fine. He thought that for Elsa's nanny Dzink was all the same as her own son, he felt powerless in this situation. His musings were interrupted by a servant. He asked Esther not to leave the room without permission, adding that he would soon bring him dinner when he returned. The hero, opening the door, replied that his father was not at home now, so there should be no trouble. The servant asked if he was still thinking about this fallen. The man rudely said to forget about him, this sinner. Esther asked him if he had nothing to do and no one to plant himself with. The man's face changed. He told Esther to put away his brother's things and put on stilettos for shoes. The man asked if his father had ordered him to do so, adding that the man was an idiot. In response, the servant only snorted. 
The hero remembered how he had defeated his brother at the spears. At first, it was only a game. His grandfather ordered him to practice more with the spear, but the result was the same. Dzink told his brother that his attacks were very bold and hard to resist, asking him how he liked his moves. Everyone in town called Dzink the Fallen on Land, though they knew nothing about him themselves. Dzink never missed training to be heir to the title of famous spearman. Esther admired him, for he kept working hard no matter what. He handled the spear rather poorly, he was good at it because of his efforts. Dzink often asked his brother for advice. It was probably humiliating for him to lose, but he still always supported Esther and treated him as usual. But one day everything changed. Grandpa loved Esther more and began to treat his brother worse. He was the one who spread the nickname Fallen. Dzink got a bad reputation and then left in an unknown direction. Esther thought it was all because of him. As he cried, he realized that he had stolen his brother's entire life. The boy wiped away his tears. It had been several days since his grandfather and father had been summoned to the royal palace. Esther wondered what they were talking about there. At this time in the royal palace, Rosalt, the former head of the Nonland Nobel House, was reprimanding everyone. He was asking how they were going to take responsibility. He was saying that in any case, the enchanter had been sent away for a certain reason, and it was a mistake. Someone from across the table added that moreover, he had escaped to the kingdom of Cole, which had nothing to do with Rosalt, and it would be extremely difficult to get him back. Jink's father was tense. Elliot, the crown prince of the Rosalt kingdom, tiredly teased the speakers, asking how long the talk about responsibility would go on. The king of Rosalt kingdom was ashamed of him. The man, turning to the king, said that this problem needed to be solved. Since he too had been involved in Jinx's banishment, it was also his responsibility. Elliot said that he thought he would be quickly eaten by goblins and kobolds, but he was lucky to get to Cole, nimble as a cockroach. He added that it was a good thing that the cockroach turned out to be an enchanter, for Elliot and his father might become enchanters too. The men at the table were puzzled. The king immediately asked Elliot to stop. But the crown prince continued, saying that Dzinka had his father's blood flowing in him, and so because of that, Elliot and his father could also become enchanters. Elliot said that Dzink was his highness's illegitimate son. The king, angry, asked why he was telling this. The prince apologized, but he continued to talk. One day he overheard a secret conversation between the king and a nobleman. He was curious, so he overheard. Elliot told his father not to worry, calling himself a ray of salvation. Pointing his finger at the guard, he said to tell the vassals, the way will bring the best sage and wizard. He blurted out that he and his father would then learn how to become enchanters. Elliot laughed loudly, and the king and others at the table had a terrible headache because of it. A man stood up from the table, asking what it meant. Jink is the king's secret child, and the nobles found out about it. He was against his banishment. That's the way his blood is. It happened because of their position. Esther's father was confused. The people at the table didn't understand what was going on. Elliot said that he and his father had nothing to do with it, but sooner or later, it would come out. The hidden sins of the royal family and the Nonland family were revealed. At this time, the servant told Esther that his rank adventurers had come to see him, to which he was surprised. He asked if they had come to see his dad or grandfather, but the man replied that it was the young master that the Sacred Flame group wanted to see. Esther replied that he would be right there. Dzink's old friends said hello to Esther, introducing themselves as the adventurers from Cole's Sacred Flame, and the fourth with them is a member of the Dragon's Tear. He introduced himself as Alex Thunder, adding that he had come to deliver something from Jink. Karen smirked at Esther, thinking how much he looked like a girl. Hero marveled and asked her to repeat what they'd said. Will was surprised that Esther didn't know anything and said that there was supposed to be a message from the Cole's Guild. Will told Esther that Dzink was alive and now living safely in Cola. Tears of happiness appeared in the hero's eyes. He took a long time to choose his words and asked if it was definitely true. Prickluseni looked at him with a smile. Esther continued to cry as he remembered Dzinka. He apologized to the adventurers, realizing that they were tired from the road, but said that he would like to introduce them to someone else, adding that she also wanted to know about her brother. Karen happily agreed. Elsa also cried tears of joy when she learned that Jink was alive. She asked Will for more details. He agreed, warning that they would be surprised and said that he was one of the four enchanters in the world. Esther and Elsa were indeed pleasantly surprised. Will continued by telling them that Jink had skills in appraisal and alchemy. 
Esther realized why he asked for his blood by looking at the card. Elsa was surprised that she didn't know that, even though she had been with him since a long time ago. Esther asked her not to berate herself, saying that he hadn't known either. Will replied that he had, he'd been careful to hide it, so it wasn't surprising, adding that he thought it was the right thing to do. Elsa thought that if word of it got out, he would be imprisoned in this country. Will apologized but said he hadn't heard any good rumors about Rosalt. He said that he knew about the incident about the poisoning of the Chancellor's family, for example. Esther was puzzled. The fact was that the king had forced the Chancellor's daughter to give birth to Dizinka, at least that's what Will had heard. Esther was lost. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. Will was embarrassed by what he'd said. The others were shocked. Karen lashed out at Will, scolding him for saying it in front of Esther, even though he had promised to be careful. He apologized, saying he'd just blabbed. Esther wondered what that meant and realized that he and his brother were not siblings. Elsa comforted the boy and told him to remember to breathe. The hero calmed down and asked to continue. Elsa said she would tell the story. The current king of Rosalta ascended the throne with the support of the chancellor and they had a secret. The truth about Jinx's birth. The king was unhappy with the state of affairs. To amuse himself, he called the chancellor's daughter to him. Apparently the princess of a neighboring kingdom, who was his wife, could find out about this, and there was a rift in the marriage, and the king's position was rapidly deteriorating. But they managed to hide the fact that the daughter of the chancellor's rather famous family was involved. They could not use brute force. Eventually the girl who was pregnant with Jink became the wife of Gordon of the Nonland family who ruled the kingdom. She used to be a maid for the chancellor who worked in their house, but the nobleman didn't like it. He didn't want to let a grandson who didn't have his blood in him become the heir. The aristocrat ended up adding slow-acting poison to the wine and food on the day of the family party at the Chancellor's house. Dizink was supposed to be there too, but he refused to practice with his spear and stayed at the mansion. And the aristocrat and Gordon left the mansion that afternoon. Nothing happened. But along with that girl, Elsa's husband and son who were servants were also poisoned. The adventurer said that it was a horrible story and such a thing was unforgivable. Elsa said that the aristocrat and Gordon warned her that if she told anyone this, she would be finished. With tears in her eyes, she said that she could not even prevent Mr. Desinka from being banished. Elsa cried. Esther said that it wasn't her fault and he was glad that she told it. He thought about that in the end Desink was not his real brother and they wanted to erase his existence. Will said that the two of them were the only ones who knew about it, and now the royal family was being criticized in the royal capital. Jink was kicked out for a reason. As a result, the crown prince doesn't like Dizink's background, the royal palace is in turmoil. Everyone noticed that Will is good with details. He replied that all the petty aristocrats who visit the palace would not give up money and easily pass on the information. Will added that he knew that the aristocrats' hemorrhoids had worsened. Elsa and Esther were uncomfortable. Alex said that he shouldn't have trusted the royal family in the first place. He thanked them for giving him a ride, but said that he, a member of Dragon's Tears, is going back to call, and this country is a sinking ship. Will asked Esther what he thought. He replied that there was nothing good left in this country. Esther turns to Karen, specifying her name. He asked Mistress Karen to make him her slave. Everyone was perplexed, and the girl was mortified by the boy. He added that his family would be condemned and he would be a criminal and enslaved, but he wanted to be Karen's slave to be with her, and then she would sell him to his brother, thus he would atone for the sins of the Nonland family. Elsa tells Esther that she's going to be a slave too. She has nowhere else to go, and she wants to be with Mr. Dizink too. Will asked if the heroes were sure of that. They answered in the affirmative and decided to hurry while packing their things. But this time, a servant outside the door overheard their conversation. He wondered if this house was finished too, and whether it was worth taking all the gold and leaving. Karen asked Esther if he would do all her bidding as a slave. He replied that yes. Karen dressed him in a maid's outfit. Esther was confused and didn't know what it meant, and Karen was very pleased. She said that he was no longer the heir of a high-ranking aristocrat. He would be recognized immediately if he did not disguise himself, since he is famous. Esther objected that he was not wearing women's clothes, but Elsa, giggling, said that it suited him very well. The boy was angry that even Elsa was going the same way. He said it was good at least his brother couldn't see. And Karen thought his outfit was bliss. Soon the heroes were already rushing around in a wagon. Alex said it was the guild's famous hippogriff wagon, and they would be traveling nonstop. Will agreed. 
The hippogriffs were rushing forward at breakneck speed. Karen was still recovering. Will said she was a demon. Esther thought of his brother, but decided he should call him Mr. D. Zink, and they were no longer brothers. At this time, D. Zink with Nina and Jan were in Gamel. It's the starting town. It's funny that they call it the City of Adventures. Nina called out to D. Zink and pointed at something. It was a huge building. The hero said that they had reached the entrance to the labyrinth, and that it was bigger than the hero thought. The building seemed quite old to Ian, he had heard that there had been a huge hole in this place in the past. He also heard that adventurers use it as a hunting ground with monsters, so it looks like a small town. The heroes may run into some nasty people, but otherwise it's a relatively safe place. Jink noticed that Ian knew a lot. He said there was something similar in his parents' house, sometimes his father would take him along on outings. The competition was the average adventurers from the clans. Nina asked the gentleman what a clan was. He replied that it was a group of adventurers consisting of several groups, and large clans could number under a hundred members. You can join a clan as a whole group, they have many advantages, such as safe bases. There are many powerful people working in Gamel. Some of them use clans for protection. Ian said it was quite a dangerous competitor for them as traders, and humans are sometimes more intimidating than monsters. Nina hoped they wouldn't meet any of those. Dezink decided that they should go to the guild first and gather more information. There was a large house in front of the heroes. It was Gamel's Adventurer Guild. Compared to the guild in Keralta, it's much bigger. Not for nothing is this city called the City of Adventurers. Stepping inside and looking around, Jink thought that it was like a cafeteria in a shopping mall. It has a completely different atmosphere and people. At the counter, the heroes were greeted by a girl, asking what they were interested in. Jink said that they were adventurers. A rather large and drunken man laughed when he heard this, calling the heroes to Hiliax and a girl. He said that if they didn't want to die here, they should find companions or join a clan. He added that even there, they would be PW Ned. The girl turned to Philip, saying that she was the one talking to the heroes. She asked them to forgive Philip, explaining that he had just had a lot to drink. Dezink replied that it was okay and held out his guild card, the girl was surprised. She shouted to the entire guild that he was S-ranked. Everyone around them perked up. The people around couldn't believe it, wondering if their clan's recruiters knew about it. Jink said that although he was s rank, his real skills weren't that high and he still had room to grow. The girl asked the hero to go to the fifth floor, thinking that she urgently needed to report that an enchanter had arrived. The guildsmen were surprised that they were sent to the fifth floor right away. Such a thing was rare. After going upstairs, the heroes settled down on the sofas. Nina even laid down, saying how soft the sofa was. The hero asked her if she was really not nervous at all. A girl came into the room, thanking Mr. D. Zink for waiting. The girl said that she would be their manager and introduced herself as Mona. She said that in their guild, they provide a manager to special adventurers of high rank, adding that she could always be approached with questions. Jink realized why everyone was so jealous of him. He said he looked forward to a long and fruitful partnership. Mona replied that she too. She started a story about the features of the maze. First of all, the characters need to buy some things to explore it. The key feature of this maze is the endless number of monsters. In addition, the corpse of the monster disappears, leaving only some part of the body, but after a few hours, the corpse will be resurrected. Also after death, there is a chance to get a magic stone or a valuable body part, they call it a drop. You can also find armor and magic items in chests scattered around the maze there. Jink thought it was a pretty elaborate maze, as if someone had designed it on purpose. Mona continued by saying that the farther they went, the stronger the monsters would be. So she asked them not to do anything rash. None of the adventurers reached the end of the maze. Inside the labyrinth, the climatic conditions may be different from those on the surface. For example, it can be humid, cold, hot, and so on. Therefore, Mona recommended to insulate the hero's clothes or to buy winter clothes, and above all not to forget about good shoes. She also recommended buying extra sets of clothes. Ian said that one could get injured during an escape or battle because of that, and it would be fatal. Mona said that if they were looking for things for adventurers, she recommended going to the guild store. Jink thought she was being pushy. Mona turned to Jink, saying that she had a request for him from the guild. It was to collect magic stones. The hero said that because of the war last year, there was now a shortage of magic stones in the Kingdom of Kull, and not all adventurers were collecting them. Magic stones in this world are something like a battery. 
Using the power of magic stones as a battery, you can light a fire or get water for natural needs. This is the kind of thing that is necessary in daily life. Nina said that low-rank adventurers have to protect themselves, so it's hard for them to also collect stones, while high-rank adventurers go deep into the depths to search for treasures. It's an indispensable item for all of them. Jink decided that they would just hunt the slime that often drops magic stones. Ian noticed that it was an easy opponent for them as beginners. Everyone entered the labyrinth. Jink warned that this was not a training exercise, but a real battle. Whatever enchantments he used would depend on the heroes. Because of this, the effect was halved. The heroes were in the open. No one nearby could be seen. Suddenly a slime appeared on the ceiling and began to attack, which was immediately shouted by the heroes. Dzink said he would help with healing if possible, but the priority would be to kill the slime. He told Nina to be on his right and to tell him if it got too dangerous. To Jan, he told her to use her sword and wind magic. Nina wasn't doing well and was distracted, not hitting the sword at all. The hero told her to calm down and remember her training. Slime was able to wrap her arm around Nina's arm in which she had a shield. But Jink managed to use the water arrow skill and severed the tentacle. He shouted to Nina to move to get her used to it faster and to watch her movements. She complied, but a little fear was visible in her face. Nina attacked her opponent. She very successfully and boldly chopped the slime with her sword. Yong was clutching his sword in his hands at this time. He easily dealt with the opponents one after another. He gathered his strength into a fist and attacked with wind magic with a battle cry. It helped him quickly deal with several opponents. Jink told the slaves that they were doing a great job, adding that they would quickly deal with them. The only thing left of the slugs were the magic stones. The heroes, standing at the ready with their backs to each other, could finally relax. Nina noticed that the slime was indeed disappearing. Ian said that thanks to the enchantment, he didn't feel tired every time after killing the slime, his body glowed. Dzink said that if they looked at their stats during the battle, they would see that they gained experience points immediately after killing the slime. Most likely, their bodies absorbed the monster's life force left as experience points. He added that progressing is different from training in the mansion, because the pumping happens during real battles. Nina shared that she was very scared at first, but then the movements improved, and now she wants to tighten up her level. Dzink said that now it is about raising the level or going through the maze. He suggested doing their assignment and going through the maze. Jan, studying the map, said that judging from the map, there was a slug room on the third floor. People with B rank and below are not allowed to enter there, except for B rank mages. A large number of different monsters can appear in the room. Once in there, heroes can only come out after a certain amount of time or until all the monsters are destroyed. Jink held out a potion to the slaves. He said that by enchanting it, it would cure all their wounds. He added that if they summed up all the enchanted items, they could reach rank B statistically. He reminded them to keep their safety in mind and not to overdo it. They agreed to do so. The heroes reached the slime room on the third floor. It was completely empty. The heroes wondered where the other people were. Suddenly the room was filled with slugs. They were here. Nina attacked with words that she could move faster. Jink said that there were more of them than he expected, so he asked the others to move away. With his magic, he created a huge hurricane that killed all the slime at once. The remnants of the slime scattered around the room. It was a water cyclone. The heroes watched from afar, marveling at how Jink handled the monsters with a single blow. The hero said that the maze of increased difficulty was not so easy. A water cyclone wastes a lot of mana, so Jink drank mana potion from a bottle. Before the slime respond, the heroes needed to collect magic stones and slime jelly. Nina apologized to Jink and said it was too early for her to fight. The latter said not to worry, adding that he was too naive. He said that Yan and Nina had earned some experience points and their levels were almost equalized. Jan said it would be smarter to just collect rocks now. Jink thought about telling the guild to fix their stats. A Ranka adventurer would become more valuable by bringing in so many magic stones. Thus, the heroes destroyed the slugs as soon as they could and paid no attention to anything else. Even the adventurers passing by were surprised that the company was beating slugs again. Nina was making progress at this time. Dzink noticed that she had developed a shield mastery skill. Now she would make an excellent tank. In the end, the heroes not only killed a lot of slugs, but also gained a lot of experience points. Jink noticed that with the new levels, they can go lower, and there is a room with goblins on the fifth floor. 
Nina said she was afraid to fight the goblins, they often attacked her village, and they stink. Dzink agreed that they don't drop as expensive drops from them, and the room itself stinks, adding that they won't go anywhere. Ian said there was a choice between the ninth floor with the kobolds or the 15th floor with the orcs. Their drops would have some value, and the smell would be better. With the current hero stats, hunting kobolds will be the best decision. Since the corks are stronger, more weapons will be needed, the heroes need to camp and prepare both physically and mentally. Nina was excited about the camp and the monster hunt and said that they were like real adventurers, adding that if the orc meat drops, she can cook it. The heroes reached the room with the kobolds on the ninth floor. Next to the wall was a magic circle. It was most likely a kobold respawn. It is near the wall so that the kobolds can only be attacked from one side. Dzink told Ian to attack with both magic and sword, saying he would replace him if he got tired. Kobolds began to appear out of nowhere. The heroes launched an attack, led by Jink. Ian deftly wielded his knife, occasionally knocking back monsters with wind magic. One of the kobolds jumped high and aimed at Nina, but she was very good at holding back the blows with her shield. In the end, the monster failed, and Nina took advantage of the moment to ride it, then delivered a fatal blow. Jink shouted that he was going to raise the water wall, so he called the heroes over to him. They immediately ran to the spot. The hero had indeed built a wall of water around them that shielded them from the monsters. The kobolds didn't understand what to do in such a situation, they couldn't get through the wall. Dzink said that this was the first time he used this ability in real combat, and that monsters couldn't penetrate such a wall. He suggested that the company take a break and pack up, because the magic stones and kobold knives would get in the way in a fight if they didn't put them away. Nina confirmed his words, saying that she almost tripped over it. Dzink said that something must be done, but first deal with the kobolds. The water wall was about to disappear, and the second round was about to begin. Ian offered Mr. Dzink an idea. He said they could speed things up if you attack them with magic. Nina can't even use normal magic, but the hero can enchant things for her. Nina liked this idea, she wanted to use magic too. Dzink noticed that she didn't have much mana. Jan said that if they gave her a potion her mana amount would increase, and she could cover them, it would take a lot of mana, but it would be worth it. Nina, hearing that she would have to drink a lot of mana potions, immediately agreed. Jink agreed to the idea as well. He congratulated Nina on being a temporary sorceress. Now she could summon a water balloon. Nina shouted the water balloon spell many times, shooting the balls one after another. Her eyes glistened with joy. After a while, she had to drink mana while the hero asked her to do it faster. After that, she continued using the water balloon. The kobolds were still not finished and were snarling viciously. Jink ordered everyone to get ready. He and Ian started attacking with air magic. The kobolds were dying on the run. The hero put up the water wall again and called a break. He said to gather things from the ground. Nina called out to Jink. She, crying, reported that she wanted to go to the bathroom. The hero said just not that and that she had had too much to drink. Nina apologized. The hero took the box out of storage with the words that there was nothing to be done. Nina with the box in her hands asked what it was. Dzink replied that he had enchanted a magic box and told her to use it. Nina was surprised. The hero said that he and Ian would turn away and not look. Nina, embarrassed, said it was an intimate manner. At that time, Jan said he wanted to go to the bathroom too. Dzink said in surprise that he was going there too. Nina moved away from the characters and shouted at them not to look or she would be offended. Dzink was surprised by this wording, after all, she is his slave. On the third day on the 15th floor, the heroes killed a huge orc. Nina was surprised that they defeated him. Dzink said that it is still hard for them to fight orcs, together though they can win, but they need to become stronger. Jan remarked that they were unharmed only because of Dzink, and he thought that he was now able to overcome his fear of orcs. Nina picked up a huge piece of meat and said that she already wanted to cook it. Jink realized that she was really going to cook the orc meat. Yan raised his level to 80 and Nina raised her level to 69. The hero said that they raised their levels even more than he expected. He believed that this place had made them real adventures. Jink noticed that it had already been three days and suggested that after this room, they should go home. Jan asked what this room was. They looked around and realized that it was the room of the boss of the orc general. Jink decided that Nina would cover the heroes from behind, and he and Jan would attack with magic. Jan and Nina were in agreement with the plan. Everyone walked into the room. 
In the middle of the large room, a monster was slumbering in the middle of the room. He looked angrily at the heroes. Dzink gave the command to go forward. The orc general ran towards the heroes while Jink also ran towards him. Nina attacked with water balloons and Ian with air magic. They managed to severely wound the orc in the arm. Yan rushed forward. The orc general became very angry. At this time, the hero was dodging his attack. Jink managed to strike with his sword right into the monster's chest. He tried to thrust the sword deep, the orc's blood splattered. But the orc general managed to throw Dzink away. He called out to Jan. He flew up and caught the monster in the beard near the neck. With a deft move, Jan slit its throat. The orc general was struck down. His arm fell lifelessly to the ground. Nina was overjoyed at the victory. She said that the orc general's meat was very tasty. Some kind of ball appeared in the monster's place. Nina was surprised and asked what it was. It was round and soft, and it smelled different. Dzink was surprised that it wasn't orc meat. Ian realized what it was. He whispered in the hero's ear that he had seen it before. It was an orc egg. Nina was already reaching for it, but the hero shouted to stop her. The heroes were sitting next to the tent with other adventurers around. Nina was boiling meat in a cauldron. It was Nina's signature orc stew. She said that orc egg is pretty rare, so she couldn't cook it. Dzink said the food smelled pretty good. A young man approached the heroes, saying that it was an unexpected encounter. Dzink asked who he was. The elf said that Mr. Dzink was rude, and that he was an adventurer, a master from the Big Tree Clan, and that his name was Luca. He said he was glad to meet the enchanter. The hero looked at his stats, surprised that he was also S rank. He thought that just like him and Karen, Luca also has a rare skill, but is it possible to reach S rank just because of an ability? His archery skill was level 232. Jinku was scared to imagine how good he was. Yen said that Big Tree was the third largest clan in Gamel. The hero asked if Luca wanted something from them. He wondered if they wanted to be invited to join the clan. Luca started to speak, but he was interrupted by people asking the heroes for food. Luca said that he came back from the lower floors, but he was attacked by a monster and got stuck for a while. He was a little embarrassed, but said he didn't think he could make it to the surface if he didn't eat. Jink realized that it wasn't about the encounter with the monster, it was about the food. The elf continued that he was embarrassed in front of the heroes, so he would pay. The hero agreed, but said he didn't have to pay. Instead, he asked to tell him about the clan. Luca promised to tell everything he could and thanked him for his cooperation. Dzink asked Nina to cook some more orc meat. She replied that of course she would. He also asked Jan to help Nina, to which he gladly agreed. After a little while, the table was set. All the people were happy with the food, thanks to Nina. She said she would give more. Everyone reveled and called her their goddess, saying that the goddess had blessed them. Luca at this time said that he had only eaten dried meat and bread in the labyrinth. Dzink said he put all the ingredients and cooking utensils in the vault. Luca said that he would now tell about the clan. There are two big clans in Gamel, the Beyond Purgatory and the Messenger. It is said that together with the Big Tree, it is the three main clans, but it is smaller than those two. The other two clans have a rigid hierarchy and power struggle. The incapable and those who lack skills will be at the bottom of the hierarchy. The low-ranked members go mad and go into the maze. Those who cannot pay the fee simply leave the adventurers, and those who leave are considered traitors and cannot join any Gamel clan. Nina asked if it was so fundamental. Dzink said that the guild rules don't say that, but it's the unspoken rules of this city. Luca continued by saying that those who don't like such orders join the big tree. Their desire is to be free. Luca said that he helps those who are in need, and those who were kicked out of the two clans come to him. Jan said they separate their own necks from their heads, and many become slaves because of debt. These clans have a pretty bad reputation. Only their name is different, but the situation is the same, and there are many people in the clans who need help. Dzink said that's why they don't have food, and that if there's an opportunity, the clans won't get involved. Luca thanked for the food and said that they should go. The hero responded by thanking him for the information. He said that they were also about to leave and offered to go together. The heroes saw a large lighted staircase ahead and began to climb the steps. Dzink rejoiced in the sunshine, saying how long it had been since he had seen sunlight. Luca said that the orc stew was delicious and that he hoped to meet again. Dzink wished Luca good luck. Luca said lastly that the two clans were looking out for the hero and asked him to be careful. After that, he left.
The hero asked Jan and Nina how they liked their first visit to the labyrinth. Nina said that it was a lot of fun, and Jan said that they both pumped up and made money, and that it was more efficient than hunting monsters in the wild. Yong asked if if they gathered people in the mansion, could Mr. Dzink organize his clan? The hero thought he wasn't sure if he could, and pondered if it would work out if he tried. Hero said that there would be an exam at school soon, so he should go back to the royal capital, and Nina and Yan could rest. The next day, Dzink came to the Adventurer's Guild. He brought a bunch of bags there, displaying it in the backyard and said that it was all in three days, and if there weren't enough magic stones, he could collect more. Nina was surprised. She said she didn't have to, and that she thought so many would do. She though she wanted him to bring more, but this was too much. Now she would have to count everything for a long time. Her eye was drawn to one of the bags. She asked if it was an orc egg. Dzink answered in the affirmative, adding that they had found it by accident. Mona gave her thanks. Before the hero could ask what for, she ran off with the egg. She managed to say that most adventurers sell it directly to merchants, and he decided to give it to them. Normally, an orc egg would sell for a high price, but the hero liked the meat better. A man with a scar on his face appeared. He said that it was not appropriate for a young girl to keep eggs. Mona addressed him by the name Dan, and was surprised that he was already here. Chink, looking at his stats, thought that this guy was that S-rank master. He introduced himself as the guild leader, Dan. He noticed that winning a dungeon with a boss in three days was pretty good. He said that the hero had fulfilled the requirements for the B-rank exam. He stated that the opponent for the exam would be him, and asked if Jink was afraid. The man replied that he wasn't, and asked what would be on the exam. Dan replied that there would be an endurance test. You have to endure his attacks for a certain amount of time. He said that the hero is a guy with a high rank and a rare skill, and it's a test to see how he can defend himself with only his abilities. Dzink remembered that Will had said something similar about the exam in Cole, about being able to defend himself. The hero wasn't sure he could do it. Mona said that even if he failed, he shouldn't worry because there wouldn't be any problems. Dan said that he didn't care what class or rank the hero was, so asked him not to think of stocking up. Dzink replied that he hadn't thought about it. Dan asked if he was sure, since young guys with great strength always want to show off. Jink said he understood and that he wouldn't hold back, adding that Dan shouldn't blame him later. Mona asked if they were done talking and suggested they start the exam. The hero asked what to do with the magic stones, but the girl replied that they would find a use for them. The hero was in Gamel's branch of the arena. His enchantment level was 52. He wore bracelets on both hands for physical strength plus 52. Coras physical strength also plus 52. All belts physical strength plus 52. Both boots, socks, and bracelet physical strength plus 52. Necklace plus 35. Four fencing rings plus 52. Enchanter's cloak physical strength plus 52. Pants, underwear, physical strength plus 52. Enchantment for physical strength, Megaric rope. Physical Enhancement 52. All in all, plus 832. He wondered if that was too much physical strength for an endurance check, but warded off those thoughts with the fact that it was Dan's own fault. Dan told the hero that he could use defense magic or a sword, the exam would go on until all the sand in the clock ran out, and that he would be disqualified if he attacked the examiner. The hourglass was turned over. The exam began. Dan said he had heard that the hero had defeated Snow, and during the exam it became clear to him how, and that he had made him pant. Dzink said that Dan was a master after all. But he thought about aiming in the wrong places and facing the sword, and it's even more interesting with a live opponent. The examiner said he was taking something long and needed to hurry up, noticing that the hero himself was out of breath. In the end, the hero misplaced his defense and damaged his sword, swords crossed. But Jink managed to hit a few times properly. He was just defending himself, it wasn't a violation of the rules. Den was surprised at this defense, and said he didn't understand anything. In the end, he lost, telling Jinku that he had passed the B-rank exam. The examiner said he was about to snap, and asked him not to look that way, adding that he would cry. The hero was puzzled. Den called the hero back, adding that they needed to talk. At this time, the people collecting the magic stones were very tired. One of them grudgingly said that they had been told it would be a lucrative and safe job. They didn't understand what else this collecting magic stones and remains was, wondering what kind of idiot came up with it. Some of them even felt nauseous. Dzink walked past them contentedly. 
Mona congratulated the hero on his temporary B rank. In the end, there are 50, 70, and 234 magic stones, 40, 193 cobbled knives, and there are also orc remains. That would be 108 gold coins, 87 silver coins, and 138 bronze coins. Dzink said that Mona didn't have to list everything. She said that since it was a temporary rank, they could no longer accompany him on safe roads, but she still asked him to be careful. Dan said he didn't need an escort anyway, he snows cold winter. The hero reminded Dan that he wanted to talk. The examiner asked what hero thought about the supply agreement. Dane replied that he hadn't thought about it and asked why he was interested. Dan recalled about the kid who got into the guild because of a fight. Jink realized that it was about Jan's abandoned brother. He was released, but his father said they could have kept him. Dan said he came here because of him. His father is a merchant working with the guild. The hero was offered a deal with him in exchange for an apology. He said that if he worked with the merchants, the guild's profits would decrease. Dan disagreed, saying that if he found out about Jinka, he would be immediately interested, and there were already many bad merchants in the world. The examiner added that it was in the guild's best interest to contract with a reliable merchant, at least he thought so. He said not to get your hopes up about the child's father, for his eldest son is a slave, and it is not known what the future holds for the second son. He told Jinku not to blame himself for what had happened, but they should meet with him. Although Jink thought he was nasty, he understood everything and didn't mind meeting him. Dan thanked and said to come to the office in two days. The hero decided to go with Jan. On the way, he thought he shouldn't have brought him along, thinking that Jan didn't want to see his father, but the man said it was fine. The heroes entered the office. Jokey Lawrence was surprised to see his son. Everyone was in the assembly. They began. Jan's father apologized and agreed to re-educate his youngest son and to make a deal on any terms. Thanks to Jan, the negotiations went better than expected. Jink thanked the slave and told him to spend time that day with his family. Yan thanked the hero. Dzink was welcomed home by the maids Mimosa and Angie. They were surprised that Jan had not returned. The hero said that he was with his family now. Angie said that he was handsome and that she was sorry she wouldn't see him today. They also gave the hero a letter. The letter was from Chris. He wrote rather come to the Brando mansion as he had two slaves who wanted to see him. Jink was shocked to read the names of these slaves. They were Esther and Elsa. Soon enough, Jink ran to the Brando mansion and was greeted by Chris. He said that the hero was royalty. Jink didn't understand anything and looked scared. He asked Chris what he was talking about, to which he replied that it was no wonder the hero didn't know that. He asked him to calm down and listen. He said that Jink was not a child of the Nonland family, but the illegitimate son of King Rosalt. People found out about this, and now there is real chaos in the royal family of Rosalt, and the kingdom is in shambles. He continued by saying that before getting into this mess, Esther and Elsa traveled abroad. Will, Karen, and Bogart appeared, saying that they had also left. Dzink asked what was going on, and that he wanted to see Esther and Elsa first. He opened the door of a small house. Esther and Elsa were sitting on the hay in their rags. When they saw Dzink, they fell at his feet. Dzink clenched his hand into a fist and asked who had done this to them. He became terribly angry and shouted asking who made them become like this. Karen interrupted him, saying it was their decision. Jink didn't understand. Chris asked him not to misunderstand because he and his mom talked him into it and despite being slaves, they treat them like regular servants. They themselves insisted on keeping their wounds untouched and said it was a punishment and an apology to the hero. He didn't understand what kind of apology. Will said that although he felt bad, he would tell Jink. Will told everything that had gone before and the exile because of those two, and now he must condemn them. It all seemed complicated to Jinku. He apologized to Chris and the Sacred Flame crew for the hassle. Karen, laughing, said not to worry, and that she liked Esther in the maid costume. Elsa and Esther never got up off the ground. Dzink told them that he was glad they were okay and that they had met again. He said he wasn't angry and wouldn't punish them, asking them to raise their heads. Karen ordered Esther to apologize to Jink. Tears came to his eyes. He apologized for everything his relatives had done, and Elsa joined in, saying he was in danger, and asked him to be more careful. The hero reiterated that there was no need to worry because they had done nothing wrong. Esther called her brother Mr. Jink. He immediately shouted with the words enough. He told Esther not to call him Mr. Thanks to him, he was able to leave the country safely. He hugged Esther with the words that he was his brother no matter what happened. The rest of the characters looked on. 
He continued by saying that for life Esther is his brother. Jinku was told to take care of them. He thanked in return. The rest of the things were to be handed over later. He said that he and Elsa would look after Esther until he was older. The hero had a plan to make him a commoner, but right now it wasn't the best option to be a commoner who escaped from Rosalt. But if a slave belongs to an adventurer of his rank, he can't be touched, so Elsa and Esther should only be slaves on paperwork for now. The hero's younger brother was against it, saying he wanted to be his slave for the rest of his life. Elsa agreed with him. Dezink said he didn't like it. In any case, the crown prince was his younger brother. Once he found out, his stats changed to the fallen seed of Nunland. Will said that according to the information he received, King Rosalta and the crown prince have been deposed and the throne remains empty. Also, the queen has filed for divorce and her home country has renounced the alliance. He added that an attack on Rosalt was only a matter of time. At this time, one of the Nonlands was executed. The people were overjoyed. He resisted, saying that it was some mistake that he was a Nonlander. But the executioner had already released the Lamb of the Guillotine. At this time, Esther's father was sitting in the dungeon of the royal capital. In the royal palace of Rosalta, the crown prince sat in a room and resented. He complained, saying he should not leave his chambers until there was confusion and considered himself imprisoned. The former king went into the chambers. He was met by his son. He asked why he had to be here. The king's eyes read anger. He hit his son on the head with all his might. The prince fell to the floor. He was bleeding. He asked his father why he had hit him. The man said that if the son had not talked, nothing would have happened. The king continued hitting his son with his staff, calling him an idiot and saying he didn't need his son in his way. There was blood all around. The prince wondered if he was dead. He didn't understand what was going on and thought it would end this way, so ridiculous. He thought it was all because of Dezink that his existence had ruined his life. He wanted to kill him. He screamed and shouted the word kill. He screamed that he would kill Dezink. At this time, Dezink gave the armor to Esther, asking if it fit him. He said he took it with him when he was banished, but it was low level. His brother replied that it was fine. He said Dezink gave him the armor, so he's happy about that. The hero then told Jan and Nina to support Esther in the maze. The hero looked at his brother's stats. They decided to start by going to a dungeon with orcs for three days. Esther should reach a level where he could win on the lower floors. Ian asked if it was okay that Esther would fight orcs right away. Esther said not to worry, and that when he was in the Nonland family, he hunted monsters with the guards, and while he was going to call, he hunted low-rank monsters. He tensely remembered that he had to fight in a maid costume since it was Karen's order, but he didn't say anything about it. Since Esther possessed wind magic, it was decided to raise his level of magic, mana, and sujutsu. Nina asked if that meant that Esther would have to drink a lot of potions, to which Jink replied in the affirmative. Then she said with a snide laugh that he too would experience the humiliation of wanting to go to the bathroom, and as his senpai, she wouldn't take her eyes off him. It's time to head to the labyrinth in Gamel. While the heroes are gone, Angie and Miosa and Elsa will be keeping an eye on the mansion. They said to rely on them. Jink said he smelled something wrong, so he asked them not to leave the mansion. The maids had swords, so they asked not to worry, saying they would use the weapons he had enchanted. The heroes arrived at the Adventure Guild where Mona learned that Esther was Jink's younger brother. She said it was a pleasure to meet him, and Esther reciprocated. Dezink asked Mona what happened and what happened while he was away. The girl asked the hero if he knew about the named monster. He replied that he had heard of one. Sometimes in this world, a dead human soul can become a monster. A person who says the right words turns into a named monster and can sometimes retain memory and intelligence. Dezink thought it couldn't be. But Mona said that the level 15 orc general they had defeated earlier had become a named monster. Jink and Esther were surprised. That monster was the prince who wanted to kill Dezink. Jink thought about the orc general from the boss dungeon being a named monster. He asked Mona if that meant his difficulty level had increased, all because he had gotten a human mind. But Mona said that rather the opposite, he was even more weak. Jink was very surprised by that. Mona said that he is the same as when he was alive, his thoughts can be predicted, and he himself has become predictable, especially every time he sees a woman, he is no longer interested in anything, even low-ranked Patty can defeat him. After a while, everyone started calling him a fool. The problem is that floor 15 has become too easy, and by 16, cues are already accumulating. This leads to a flood of inexperienced adventurers to the lower floors and conflicts between factions. 
but more and more people are not returning from the labyrinth. So it's a tricky situation right now, so Mona asked for help. Jink replied that all he can do is use enchantment, the main thing is not to overdo it. Mona thanked Dzink very much. The heroes found themselves on the 15th floor. Esther was standing right in front of the monster, attacking with an air slash. Nina attacked with a water balloon and Ian attacked with a sword. The heroes quickly defeated the monster. Jan noticed that Esther was getting better at using magic and that the heroes were winning faster. The boy thanked Jan for his praise. Esther said that he had gotten stronger and that it was a good workout. Dzink said that he had hoped that the attack power would also increase, but because of the magic, the level didn't rise much. Nina noticed that although Esther drank the mana potion, he didn't want to go to the bathroom. She thought that he might have gone to the bathroom beforehand. Dzink realized what Nina was thinking, but he knew that Esther was used to enduring because of the aristocratic society. In any case, Esther had raised his level considerably. The heroes had rested enough and decided to go down to the lower floors. Esther remarked that in order to do so, they would have to defeat a Durer, and they would have to face the wrath of the orcs. Dzink said that even though he was weak, it stunk, as a last resort he decided to ATK him himself. He also thought to try to keep Nina out of it since he likes girls. The heroes entered the dungeon. Zasp of Nurka Durak with the words that he would kill Dzink. Esther didn't understand why the orc called his brother's name. Seeing the orc's stats, Dzink realized it was Prince Elliot. Esther was surprised that he was able to be reborn. Ian asked Dzink if he knew him. The hero replied that he did, and that he was a jerk. The orc walked towards the heroes and kept saying the word kill. Everyone realized why he was a douche. The hero stood right in front of the monster, yelling that he was his opponent and that he would defeat him. The monster screamed, but Jink released a fireball at him. But this ability did almost no damage. Jink wanted to try out his level 1 fire magic, that's what he was capable of. The monster roared. Suddenly, Elliot saw Esther and distracted himself from Dzink, running in the opposite direction screaming for the woman. With his spear, the boy struck the monster in the face, saying he was a man. Elliot crumpled behind his head. Dzink shouted at him not to be distracted. He repeated that he was his opponent. The monster recognized Dzink. Jumping up, the hero dodged Elliot's blow and began aiming himself with a shout. In that jump, Dzink swung his sword straight through the monster's head. Everyone waited with bated breath for the outcome of the battle. Elliot's head was cut in half, blood pouring out. His dead body fell on his back. Dzink was still wondering what kind of encounter this was. Nina noticed the egg that came out of the monster. The hero thought that since the monster turned out to be him, he didn't want to pick up his egg. He thought that the monster left him because he had a strong libido when he was alive. Well told that the crown prince had fallen, Esther thought he might have been executed. Dzink said that apparently an undead soul runs the risk of becoming a monster, and Elliot was also undead. The souls of the monsters in Gamel's labyrinth are forever locked there. He will be resurrected many times, and will continue to earn experience points and items, and will continue to kill adventurers. The heroes were glad that they had passed the dungeon with the boss, and planned to go to the most popular location. On the way to it, the heroes had to defend themselves from the bats. Dzink was even out of breath, it was getting quite difficult for him. Esther noticed that they were on the spot. It was the 20th floor, an ore cave. It was very beautiful there, and there were many people walking around. There were even ore miners in the cave. Jan said that there really were a lot of people there. Dzink said that different crystals could be found there, as well as emerald and diamonds. He suggested that the heroes make money. Esther and Nina were the first to want to mine the ore. The hero took some picks with him, telling the others not to overdo it, because mining ore takes a lot of effort. Esther saw the crystals he wanted to collect, and Ian asked if he was sure he could. Jan said that there was no valuable ore there, and it was necessary to try further. When Esther asked why, Jan explained that he used the appraisal skill, and could tell that there was a lot of emerald to be found there. Jink told Ian that wasn't bad, and he didn't even notice Ian using the appraisal skill. Nina decided to check where Jan was pointing. The heroes started digging, and they found a lot of green stones. Esther realized that it was an emerald. Dzink thought how much fun this was, and what fun Esther and Nina were still kids. Jan was holding a huge pile of jewelry, saying he was having fun in his own way too. Dzink was asked if he would dig, he said he would, he just wanted to try something out. There were a lot of rocks left around, the hero was wondering if he should collect them. 
He wanted to practice earth magic and created a golem out of these leftovers. Esther admired his brother's creation. Jinx said that holding it requires mana, and even now he couldn't control it well. The guild said that the more materials in it, the more it can resist traps and arrows. It could be used as a shield and pass through traps. The golem started mining ore. Dzinx said that it could do other things, and now they could use it to mine more ore. Suddenly, the heroes heard a commotion in the crowd. Two groups of people were arguing. One was saying that the area was off limits, and if those people kept digging, they would kill them. A man from the third group was saying that they, the messengers, were the ones who found the place in their crowd shouting to the others to get lost. Jink realized that they had misplaced something even though they were adults. He decided that they needed to finish the job soon and that the fun treasure hunt was ruined. The heroes went further and finally reached the 21st floor. This place was called The Step. Esther noticed that it was very different from the rest of the maze and Nina said that it was as if they were outside. Hero said that for some reason, it was bright all day long there, and that it was a mysterious maze. Green cows lived there, and their meat is delicious. Esther said he liked the orc meat better, and Nina asked if the brothers had tried the green cows. Dzinx said once, when they were aristocrats, It's a delicacy because you can't get it much anywhere. Nina drooled at the mouth and asked if they would hunt them, and Jan said he was hungry. Dzinx remembered Mona's words about more and more people not returning from the labyrinth. He thought about the fact that despite her words, everything was fine. The heroes decided to cook the meat of the cows. Meanwhile, huge insects that the heroes didn't even know about were eating human remains nearby. 